Good morning, everyone. My name is Gia Greer McGinnis, and I'm a senior lecturer in the University of Maryland's Graduate School and the executive director of the UMB Cure Scholars Program. And I'll be your moderator for today's session. I welcome you to our second webinar sponsored by the Program in Vulnerability and Violence, which is a groundbreaking academic partnership between the University of Maryland Baltimore and Coventry University. Links are being placed in the chat with more information on how to apply to the program, which offers both MS and certificate options. Everyone participating in today's session, including myself, are affiliated faculty with the program and classes start in August, so we hope you join us. In the first webinar of the series, we learned that there are many structural factors that contribute to violence. We also learned that there are social and emotional dimensions to this issue that also need to be considered. This webinar will focus on responses to violence and vulnerability and community-based interventions and strategies that have been adopted. Note that there will be a third webinar for the series on April 27th on vulnerability, victimhood, and breaking the cycle. So please consider joining us for that. Also note that the session is being recorded for those who are unable to attend as will future events. We have a great panel here today and their full bios are in the chat. However, I will introduce them quickly. First, we have Mike Hardy, Professor of Intercultural Relations and Founding Director of the Center for Peace, oh, Center for Trust, Peace, and Social Relations at Coventry University. Next, we have David Micklehatton, Director of the Institute for Peace, Security, and Social Justice, and Professor at Coventry University. Next, we have Toby Tremgarin, Associate Director for the Center for Dispute Resolution at the Maryland Carey School of Law and clinical instructor. And last but not least, we have Carol Vidal, Assistant Professor of Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences at the Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine. The format for today will consist of brief opening remarks from our panel, followed by questions and answers. Participants will be muted for the duration of the program to reduce background noise, but we encourage you to enter any questions you have into the questions box. And with that, I will invite Mike to begin our remarks. Thank you so much, uh, Gia, and uh, good afternoon from London. Um, hello to everyone. And I hope some of you participated in our first seminar um, a couple of weeks back when Lenwood and Tyron, Adam and Ali, colleagues of ours, outlined, as Gear, Gear suggested, some of the sources and structural issues concerned with both vulnerability and violence. And we've got an eclectic group of, uh, uh, of inputs uh, today. My focus is drawn really from my direct experience, not just as a scholar, but also as a member of the Hate Crime Commission in the City of London, and I now also sit on the UK's West Midlands Domestic Abuse Advisory Board. Um, this is a terrible time for violence in our communities. And I suppose the, the, the eclectic collection of inputs at today's webinar highlight the range of uh, focus and context that we're looking at. My first slide, I'm, I'm, I'm starting with a rap song. I'm not going to sing it, you'll be very pleased to see. But this is a very iconic and powerful message from contemporary culture about violence and about its role and pervasiveness in our societies. And I want to then go on to talk about community responses and the sorts of issues and the sorts of approaches that we're taking on a holistic approach to looking at vulnerability and violence together. You know, you won't see a face till the eyelids drop and you won't hear the screaming until it stops. So in my brief comments on working from home, hate crime and domestic violence, we're raising this up front because during the coronavirus uh, pandemic, we've seen a, an exponential growth in the problems of spatial and social distancing. It's not just keeping apart, but it's throwing people together. 
and two powerful commentaries of this context in the UK at the moment, and I know there's similar data in the States. Abusers always work from home. Abusers don't have relationships, they take hostages. And just as much as social distances keep us safe from the virus, it throws people together in confined and locked down contexts. And this has been a focus of our work in both the Hate Crime Commission, where the uh, abuse of difference in our communities continues, whether it be ethnicity, race, age, um, or gender. And well, now that domestic violence has become an even greater problem in our midst. So for this, community metrics matter and community attitudes matter. And so a lot of the studies we do are to record the frequency and prevalence to get a greater level of understanding about the nature of the problem so we can together work on solutions and work on uh, mitigating uh, policies. My little list here, 50 times, you know, it takes, on average, women in the UK are abused 50 times before they ask for help. That's an astonishingly challenging and condemnatory statistic, I think. Most women in abusive situations in domestic confines spend three or four years on average before they manage to escape or deal with this. And there's a mixture of self-esteem, fear, and guilt that explains that. Interestingly, our statistics on the London Commission show that only 4% of complaints are actually false. So we're living in a place where complaining is difficult, where the incidence is high, and where our responses clearly are not adequate. Community responses are required that mobilize compassionate collaboration. In my very brief talk, I only have a chance to illustrate some of these points. And I want to explore how emotional awareness has been used as a preventative and a curative approach in some of the work we've done. Very briefly, and these slides can be made available afterwards, I don't want to bombard you with data. Emotional responses and becoming comfortable with emotion is seen as a hugely important strategy and solution for dealing with violence and vulnerability in our, in particularly in contemporary societies. Here is a table that just shows the sort of analysis that we could use. The four key primary emotions of fear, anger, joy, and sadness are drivers and triggers for the outcomes that uh, we see in violence and abuse. Each of these drivers bring reactions but also highlight, in my view, what we can do about it and how community responses can mobilize behind solutions. So this final column tries to show that. So fear is caused by the presence of a threat. We know that. And our normal reaction is just to get safe. Just getting safe doesn't actually respond to the context in which violence becomes the language of the relationship behind that. So the sort of policy solutions that communities are currently discussion, next time you feel fear, ask yourself what the threat is and ask yourself how you can get safe. In other words, think more about, and as a community, wrap your arms around victims and around those who are abused to help them think that through. If I had more time, we could go through them all, but look at joy, look on the other side. Let's not just be miserable. Joy is a primary emotion caused by the presence of pleasure. What we tend to do, our reaction is to share good feelings with others. So next time you feel joy, share it. And interestingly enough, the absence of sharing of joy is one of the triggers that leads to the prevalence of violence among those who are vulnerable. Sadness is caused by loss, and our inability to deal with loss tends to also explain some of the more powerful uh, consequences. So I've looked very briefly at the role that emotion has in as a trigger and as a stimulant of violent reactions to some of the changes in, in contemporary society. Some of the combinations of these primary emotions are also interested. So fear and joy together leads to excitement Anger and sadness leads to frustration. So if you didn't come to this webinar to be told about primary emotions and reactions, but this is a stark reminder of the conversations that we have as policymakers and as academics 
around developing community-based strategies asks us to look carefully at the triggers and drivers of violence, at the sources of vulnerability, so that we can develop more holistic policies. Thank you. I think it's over to me now. So greetings, everybody, from Belfast in Northern Ireland. And uh, hopefully you can all see my screen. So let's see it. There we go. Can everybody see it? Yeah. Excellent. So uh, I, I'm, as uh, Gia said at the start, uh, I'm David Markle Hatton. I'm the, the director for the Institute uh, for Peace, Security and Social Justice at Coventry University. Uh, and uh, my, my background is in uh, counterterrorism and how we can protect people and places from the, the threat, risk and harm of terrorism. Uh, and I do it because of uh, the, the difference that, that I know uh, that research and and uh, an applied research in this area can actually have for keeping people safe. This this is a, a sort of a, an example of uh, uh, of the not the type of work that I do, but the type of work that I inform. So this is this is a physical intervention that was put onto uh, one of the bridges in London in uh, in response to uh, an attack that happened in 2017. Um, and it's, it's sort of characteristic of how governments uh, and law enforcement and, and other agencies are reactive to, uh, to, to violence rather than proactive to vulnerability. Um, so the majority of my work is, is concerned with uh, understanding, countering and mitigating the impact of terrorism. Uh, mostly uh, I've focused on preparing and protecting soft targets and critical infrastructure. Uh, and particularly in how the urban environment shapes and is, and is shaped by violence and vulnerability. And uh, this, this photo is a, uh, is a good example of how uh, basically vulnerability has, uh, has shaped the urban environment. It's a train station, I'll, I'll not tell you where, uh, but uh, as you can see, the, you've, you've got bollards uh, and concrete blocks uh, beside the road. They, they don't fit in. They were they were reactive to uh, to the train station being vulnerable, uh, and despite no violence actually taking place. Uh, and what this has has then done is created the perception of uh, uh, of fear in this area that something might happen, uh, and it and it's been a a big challenge uh, not just for here but for for many different organisations uh, worldwide. Then uh, another area of my research is being from Northern Ireland has, has focused on how, uh, how communities are, are protected from, uh, from violence. On the, on the left hand side, you, you, you can see uh, this is uh, the, the police deployed last night along the, the, the peace wall in Belfast, which, which runs for miles and it separates uh, basically uh, uh, Republican and loyalist communities. The picture on the right is uh, is a police station in, in Belfast, and it looks more like a, a military outpost in a war zone. Uh, and that that's one of the challenges that we face. If we, if we create the perception of a war zone, it usually uh, creates warriors who want to fight. Uh, and that's what we've experienced over the, the past five nights in, in Northern Ireland, where, where we have had sustained uh, rioting and uh, public disorder. This uh, is actually the, the interface between the, the loyalist and, and Republican areas where physical interventions were put in. So this is a, this is a gate that, that was closed yesterday by the police to prevent the uh, uh, loyalists and Republicans from attacking each other. And you'll see on the gate, there was never a good war or a bad peace. Uh, but unfortunately, what we've done is we, we've uh, uh, we've put in these physical interventions, but uh, in recent times, they've just acted uh, to coalesce the violence in those areas. And I'm just going to play a very, very short video uh, of some of the violence last night at a so-called peace wall, uh, which actually hasn't really uh, 
created peace, but it has acted as the epicenter for violence. And, and th these are the types of things that, uh, that, that a lot of my work uh, has informed over the, the, the past 15 uh, years. And uh, I'm, I'm not here to give you a, a, a research presentation, but to, to hopefully give you an understanding of how uh, the urban environment shapes and is shaped by uh, violence and vulnerability. And that is my five minutes of fame for everybody. It's my turn, right? Hi. Well, thank you for having me and um, nice to see everyone. And also um, thank you for everyone who's connecting. I don't have slides, but I think um, what I'm gonna do is I'm, trying, I'm gonna try to tell a little bit of a story. Like uh, Gia said, I'm a child psychiatrist and I'm interested in injury prevention and how it overlaps with mental health and substance use. Um, and I'm gonna try to bring it from Europe to the United States with my story. So I'm originally from Barcelona, from Spain. And although we do have uh, violence and terrorism, we had a long history of terrorism. Um, there are not as many gun um, violence deaths as there, is, there are in the United States. So when I first moved here and I did residency in Baltimore, I uh, started working with adults that had a lot of histories of gun violence that almost seemed unreal to me. It seemed like they were coming from a movie more than actual reality, but I was looking at charts and seeing gunshot wound on a regular basis. And um, I realized how big of a problem um, violence was in Baltimore. And then this became even more real when I did my child and adolescent psychiatry fellowship. And I realized how violence conditioned not only um, the person itself, but also the behaviors that people had in their communities and also the diagnosis that the kids that I was seeing were presenting. I was diagnosing with a lot of children with ADHD, but um, as soon as I started taking them into a type of therapy that we did for kids with PTSD, which is called um, trauma-focused CBT, I realized that a lot of those symptoms resolved after they did therapy for trauma. So that let me, when I moved to Hopkins, to expand a little bit from the clinical to the, to the public health arena. And I started working with a team that uh, did public, uh, uh, public health intervention that was basically increasing awareness about the effects of trauma in the communities and in hospital staff. So we did a lot of trainings on um, what trauma is, how it affects your behaviors and even your biology and um, the sort of interventions that you can do. And that gave me also a chance to work with some of the organizations in the community uh, in Baltimore, such as Safe Street or Roca. And I started learning more about these interventions um, and what was effective and what was not. What was not. Um, and um, there are so many interventions for violence prevention. So some, some of them, and then they can range from your, uh, you know, from little kids as early as preschool programs to school, uh, school-based programs um, and emotional, social emotional curriculums in schools to more specific interventions for um, adolescents who uh, need more support from the community like um, MST, multisystemic therapy or FFT. Um, and then also interventions that you can do from the healthcare setting too, which Baltimore has some both at Maryland and at Hopkins and then police programs, um, which I can tell, there's so much I wouldn't be able to be able to fit it all in, in five minutes. Um, but some of them inc include also some changes in social norms, um, like the Baltimore ceasefire that we have here in Baltimore, or some that have done internationally, like a, a program called Edutainment, which was done in Rwanda to, um, through a, a telenovela, which basically brought together people from different uh, ethnic groups that were at conflict at the time. And then um, some very popular national programs like the Cure Violence Program, which is the Safe Streets Program called here, which basically has these um, core components, which is like detecting and interrupting potential co um, violent conflicts and then treating those at high risk for violence and then trying to also change the social norms, which brings all this together. And at the same time, you try to get data and monitor the improvement. But um, and there's a good, for anyone who's interested, there's a good um, report on the Northern Triangle, which is the area of America that has the highest levels of violence that includes the United States, that studied all the, those programs and which ones had more evidence and which ones 
had uh, lower evidence, and then they they uh, classified them in three areas. So you could do uh, there were like primary prevention programs, which is you intervene before there's any violence. Secondary prevention programs, which after the violent event has happened, you intervene, and then uh, tertiary prevention, which is basically when you try to work on rehabilitating uh, people that have victims or perpetrators of violence. And they looked also at whether those programs were in, um, focused on the place where violence happened, on the people or on the behaviors. And they found that the most effective were um, a program called Focus Deterrence, which you basically you work with the police um, in, and the police works with the community on, so they're also called pooling levers, um, a pooling lever strategy, where you try to really focus on a crime problem, like you could just maybe focus on youth and gun homicide, for example, and then try to identify what the offenders and the behaviors are, and then you just conduct um, um, specific interventions, but always with the message that there, the police is there to support you, but if you go to the bad place and you still has you have still have negative consequences with the law. So those have proven to work. And then the other one, which links it back to mental health, is this CBT, which is cognitive behavioral therapy, which is a very common um, type of therapy in in mental health. Um, in in this case, they focus on changing the the distorted thinking and behavior of juvenile offenders. And um, basically like working on, you know, maybe if they tend to self-justify the way they think, try to work on that, or if they misinterpret social cues, which makes a lot of sense because many of them have had histories of trauma. So they tend to misinterpret other people's behaviors. You try to work on that too. And um, uh, they work on their moral reasoning and um, also on their schemas of like dominance and entitlement and things like that. And there's a good program here in, in Baltimore, which started in uh, Massachusetts called ROCA, and they've had a lot of success. And finally, I just want to say that it's difficult to talk about violence in, um, in the United States without talking about guns. And I won't get into it too much, but there are two big things about violence here that make violence so present every day. And it's um, guns and income inequality. And both of those together just make a really bad, bad combination. And hopefully we'll get into it with the program or maybe today, but that's all I have to say. <laughs> Thank you. Great. Thank you, Carol, Mike, and um, David. I'm going to pick up with what Carol was talking about with youth and also this kind of topic of a proactive uh, conflict resolution or even kind of prevention of conflict. And I think that it is actually one of the greatest challenges um, that uh, that we face because public and private institutions and individuals often don't focus on an issue until there is a problem. And even more commonly, uh, something that might even be characterized as a, as a crisis, right? I think we've spoken about our reactive nature. Uh, and I see this a lot of time in the work that I do, both in interpersonal disagreements and in broader systemic issues. So at the interpersonal level, um, we often have this perception of I should be able to resolve this myself, right? So that perspective is, is kind of a barrier to actually approaching something or the sense that it's really just not that big a deal. I'll just ignore it. Or if I don't deal with it, it will go away. And we just know that that internalization of, of conflict um, actually helps for it to, to increase and be become greater. There's also a perspective sometimes that bringing in a third party or kind of going to another organization makes the conflict seem bigger than it actually is. And there's also a barrier for uh, getting a resolution. At the systemic level, public and private institutions are more reactive. There has to be a problem to address before the resources will be dedicated to the issue. Efforts uh, on violence reduction require violence. Processes for eviction diversion in the time of COVID requires housing instability. And we know that uh, housing stability is a key factor in vulnerability, negative health indicators, and exposure to violence. So given this dynamic, where do proactive conflict resolution processes and practices fit in and how can they have an impact? 
And so in our work at the Center for Dispute, Dispute Resolution, we look at some of these predictors of violence and places for upstream interventions that have the potential to change trajectories. We know that common, to take schools for example, common exclusionary practices such as suspensions and expulsions have long-term impacts on youth. We know that students that receive a suspension or expulsion are more likely to get one again and that there is a direct relationship between disciplinary school action and involvement in the juvenile and criminal justice system justice systems. We know that exclusionary practices disproportionately impact students of color and students with disabilities. And this uh, pathway is so prevalent that it has a, a name. It's called the school to prison pipeline. And it's facilitated by a combination of factors. Um, in the United States in particular, there was a real um, push towards zero tolerance disciplinary policies and practices. It was um, kind of consequential bias disciplinary decisions by teachers and administrators, increased school presence in schools, and also, frankly, the criminalization of what would have otherwise been kind of normal childhood behavior. Uh, in 10 years of review of, of research conducted by the American Psychological Association Zero Tolerance task force. They found that zero tolerance policies not only fail to make schools safer, but actually increase behavioral issues and dropout rates. And in Maryland, after looking at uh, empirical research, discipline data, and input from stakeholders, the Maryland State Department of Education found that, quote, the common presumption that exclusionary punishments like suspensions make schools safer is unsupported and contradicted by extensive evidence. And this formal finding solidified the state's efforts to really push toward a rehabilitative, more restorative and proactive uh, approach rather than the reliance on exclusionary practices. And so our center has done a lot of work um, at the school level, the state level, policy and uh, training to really promote this use of restorative approaches, which combine a relationship focused mindset and distinctive tools to create a school climate and culture that is inherently just, racially equitable, and conducive to learning for all students. And it really is designed to counteract some of these zero tolerance policies and really push um, against some of the uh, factors in the pipeline. It aims and focuses on proactive interventions, uh, although it does have some reactive responses. Uh, affective statements and questions, circles, peer mediation, relationship building are all core uh, uh, practices in a restorative approach in schools. And in Baltimore City, we're finding that it is having an impact. A study conducted by Johns Hopkins University and with the Open Society Institute Baltimore found that schools that implemented restorative approaches saw a suspensions decrease in their schools by an impressive 44% in one year. The majority of school staff found that restorative practices improved school environment and climate and increased relationships between teachers and students. And we know that that it is a single positive relationship that really can have an impact. I know Gia can talk about that in her Cure Scholars program. And that um, schools that pursue this whole school approach really do focus on proactive circles and community building throughout the day. And so this kind of push at the state level came about through uh, a task force and a recommendation and eventually um, legislation, which the center kind of testified on behalf half of and worked um, toward. I'll put a link to the report uh, in the chat for individuals that wanted to kind of get some more information. But it is a combined approach because also at the same time in Maryland, we're looking at what is the role of school resource officers, police essentially in school, right? What is the value in having uh, suspensions and expulsions in grades pre-K through two, right? And so there was some legislation passed about um, reduction in that and, and additional requirements in that. So it really is this um, combined approach of looking at uh, systemic proactive changes, sometimes in legislation, but also really focusing on these uh, downstream impacts that can have a real um, change in the trajectory 
of violence and vulnerability. Thank you, Toby. I'm going to share my screen now. And as I do that, just a reminder to the audience, feel free to uh, start putting questions in the question and answer box. So um, my presentation is on the UMB Cure Scholars Program, which is a presidential level initiative here at the University of Maryland, Baltimore, that focuses on West Baltimore youth. And in the first webinar, uh, Tyron Roper from our Community Engagement Center spoke frequently about the impact of role modeling and um, just having positive mentors in his life and the pathway that it created to him for uh, success. So our program's mission is to identify West Baltimore youth and prepare them for healthcare and research careers. Um, we do this by providing year-round experiences for them. We we'll also take a holistic approach that involves a social work program, which we'll talk about in a minute. And in general, we're looking to uh, expose the scholars to the wonders of science, get them excited about it, uh, and hopefully inspire them to pursue careers in the future. To give you a little bit of context about Southwest Baltimore, uh, where our scholars come from, uh, these are communities that are largely under-resourced. Um, there are high rates of poverty. Um, you know, the median household income is about 28,000 in US dollars. Uh, and also the violent crime rate is 27.9%. Uh, and just to put it in perspective, Baltimore City as a whole, uh, the crime rate is 15.2%. So this is an area that has been deeply impacted by uh, violence. Uh, and we recruit our scholars uh, from three West Baltimore middle schools. And we do this every year, the same three schools as a commitment to um, our West Baltimore neighbors. So um, university leadership uh, really, really prioritizes trying to provide programming to our immediate neighbors. So just some quick facts. CURE actually stands for a Continuing Umbrella of Research Experiences, and it's actually a national program of the National Institute of Health through their National Cancer Institute. Uh, the program originally launched as a pilot in 2015, and it was the first CURE in the country to target middle school students. Uh, over time, university leadership felt it was important to continue to work with these youth over time. They didn't just want to run a middle school program. So we've created what's considered a pipeline program where youth are actually recruited at sixth grade. And in the US, that's uh, ages 11 and 12. Um, and we follow them all the way until high school graduation. In the US, that's uh, ages 17 or 18 when they will exit the program. And our oldest scholars are actually juniors, so that's around age 16. So we're not yet at full capacity. Uh, our program formats, we have after school programming, Saturday Academy. Uh, we also have summer enrichment programs. And for our older scholars, we have a partnership with Baltimore City's summer jobs program where um, our high schoolers can actually be compensated to do STEM field experiences and also have individualized uh, internship placements. Our programming formats are, um, we also have STEM education programming, but as our scholars have gotten older and they're approaching college age, we have launched recently college and career programming. So we're helping our scholars think about colleges and career programs and um, next year for our juniors, we'll be helping them actually apply uh, to college. The program pairs scholars with mentors and those uh, mentors perform a wide variety of functions for our program. Right now we have 138 active scholars across our pipeline uh, for middle and high school. And these are just some photos of the program. Again, the, the purpose is to really expose them 
to as many different career paths as possible and just show them that there are alternative pathways to what is presented to them in their day to day environment. Uh, we rely really heavily on internal university resources. So UMB has seven academic units of uh, anywhere from dentistry to nursing to medicine, uh, to law, social work. And so we actually rely heavily on faculty and students to uh, come into our classrooms, um, kind of talk to them about what they do. Uh, we also have our teachers that run labs and after school. So um, you'll see there's a photo of two young ladies uh, doing a very small scale dissection that's from our after school program. Um, we've had people do wellness programming with our scholars. Uh, we also do kind of field trips across campus. So the top middle picture is actually our university president, Dr. Bruce Jill, on a field trip with our scholars. They got to see the Da Vinci surgical robot at the medical center on campus. Uh, we also have a great partnership with our school of dentistry. So the photo of um, the mentors and scrubs and our scholars with face masks on is actually our annual oral health day where um, scholars get to learn about oral health careers and do hands-on activities and also get free dental care at the same time. One thing that we learned very early in the program's inception is it wasn't enough just to offer STEM education programming that our scholars were facing barriers in their community, um, often issues that Toby and Carol have described in their work, our scholars have experienced directly. So um, early in the years of the program, a full-time social worker was hired. And now we also have a partnership with our School of Social Work to offer three interns a year that do uh, help us with case management. We also have support groups for the scholars. And unfortunately, um, we have have had to deal with bereavement support as our scholars have lost loved ones to violence, but also chronic illness and mental health crisis. So um, especially in the pandemic, that's become an even bigger issue for us. Uh, resource allocation uh, where needed will provide the scholars with technology, especially in the pandemic for online learning. We've been giving out Chromebook computers. Uh, we provide also acute food resourcing, as well as energy assistance. And at the top of the pandemic, we actually launched an emergency fund as some of our families, especially now as some of the legal supports are lifting uh, to help with eviction prevention, uh, assist with BGE bills, uh, Baltimore gas and electric bills, um, and things like that. We have a CURE parent organization, which is kind of like a PTA for CURE. Uh, where we get input from our parent community. We also use their monthly meetings to present them with information on workforce information, um, what's going on with their youth in terms of employment, uh, financial literacy, uh, anything the parents are interested in learning about, we'll bring a speaker in for them to hear a presentation once a month. We also have service referrals to local psychiatric services and we also refer them to the Community Engagement Center at UMB because they have uh, a wide variety of services that are available to the community, anywhere from food resourcing to um, workforce development programs. And so um, I'm actually the last person to give remarks. Uh, so now we're actually transitioning into our question and answer period, and I see there are some things uh, coming in. So please do continue to put your questions in. But I'll get us started with a uh, first question, and that's how do we scale up in our thinking about responses to violence and look to policies and approaches that are more at community level? And I don't know, uh, Mike, if you have initial thoughts to get us started. Well, <clears throat> there's been a, an interesting theme running through from David to Carol to Toby about it seems that how we, when we make ourselves safer, we somehow create opportunity for more violence, whether it's uh, by closing down in pandemic and forcing people into confined relationships or whether it's in David's case with big structures and bollards 
we have to step up, I think, by looking at the complexity and, as we're saying, the whole system issue of, of, of violence. There are a couple of really good questions that I've responded to in writing in the Q&A. Um, but essentially, I'm very pleased that there is more recognition now about the power of emotion and the power of emotional awareness. Um, and it's not just about how we as policymakers or academics in, uh, introduce emotion as part of the policy armory, but it's also about community attitudes. You know, just a final, final remark as an indication. Why is it that communities themselves are so weak when it comes to recognizing some of the powerful drivers and triggers of violence and vulnerability? How often do we hear that if it was so bad, why did it take that woman so long to complain? How often do we hear, you know, so why is it coming out now, a decade later? Why do we hear, why is it playing out on social media rather than in the courts? The, the answers are very clear. And it's because generally speaking, we're not taking this holistic view, this, this helicopter view of the whole problem. As Toby said, to reduce violence, you have to have violence to start with. To reduce vulnerability, you have to have vulnerable. So clearly we're too little and too late. And I think it's, it's that big lesson that's come across from these opening remarks. Does anyone else have anything else to add? Um, I also would like, I really do personally try to think about kind of how do we create incentives to, you know, proactively um, address things, right? The, the funding for a lot of these services and programs kind of exists once the, the issue exists. Um, you know, how can you incentivize and kind of build the individual capacity, community-based capacity, um, government and structural to, to really kind of prioritize and incentivize some of these uh, proactive ways and then also kind of the sustaining ones as well. I think that's the other challenge is that once you kind of have the success, right? Like as David said, once we have the peace wall, right? And um, and so now now we're done. And um, you know, I know that my my class in the uh, degree program is going to talk about kind of this sustaining um, kind of that sustaining that peace, sustaining um, nonviolence and and the the challenges and, and ways to do that. What's interesting, Toby, is that uh, we now have more peace walls in Northern Ireland um, since the, the Good Friday Agreement was signed in 1998 than what we did at the height of our troubles. So it's it, it's the sustaining for, of peace for us uh, has been about, uh, unfortunately, creating segregation within communities. Now, my, my background in, in counterterrorism, I, I look at terrorism as nothing, nothing more than a vulnerability that gets exposed and exploited. Uh, and uh, it's, it's those vulnerabilities that, that we've always uh, sought to try and reduce. And by doing that, uh, it, it should reduce uh, the, the amounts of violence that, that happens. Um, but it, it, we we find that uh, that sustaining peace uh, is is very very difficult. It took us nearly forty years to get peace, uh, and now now it's hanging on the uh, basically on a on a balance uh, because of Brexit, because of uh, uh, decisions that were that were taken about uh, one side of a community not not following COVID rules uh, and also about uh, uh, basically uh, organized criminality having drugs taken from them and and, and that's one of the the biggest uh, issues that we've faced we've created an industry for peace but that industry has in the majority rewarded those that were involved in the violence before and that's been our biggest problem. As soon as you take those incentives away, uh, you're, you're then trying to uh, to reduce the vulnerability again.
Great, thank you. Gia, we had a question from Amy, one of our audience about, which I wanted to share because I, I'm not sure if, if everyone's seen yep. it, about social identity. And I thought it was really important to just to, to, to bring that up. And the, the issue that we, we live more, more often than not in multicultural communities and one size doesn't fit all, but I don't want us to fall back onto the assumptions that some communities, some ethnicities, some race, some genders, some age groups um, should be dealt with differently. This is, a, this is a pandemic in itself, violence. And we have to find ways of understanding it so that we can bring to bear some of the conditions more likely to change behaviors. It's not a question of pointing at culture and pointing at ethnicities or pointing at gender. It's a really an issue of, of looking more carefully at how, as Toby said, we can incentivize types of behavior and disincentivize others. School exclusion doesn't help as, as the evidence shows, but what do you put in its place? You don't just say no, you have to be more proactive and more anticipative of the sorts of things that might work. So thank you, Amy, for your question. And actually, uh, another question uh, from the question box is, do you think that the lockdowns associated with the pandemic will make us even less able to tap into our primary emotions and make domestic violence even worse? I think this is a question for you, Dr. Hardy. And so I've, I've agreed. I, know, I think it is, there are major problems with the social distancing that we need to keep us safe. But it is one of these soft examples of how making us safe has created more problems. Um, it's a complex adaptive system in which we work and we're faced with wicked problems. And the wicked problem you solve are social interaction and reduce the virus transmission, but you create other problems on the side. But I think the point behind the question was, does this make it less easy to share and develop an emotional collaboration or collaborative emotional sharing? Well, I think it does. And I think one of the problems with lockdown is our inability to find succor with other like people, with other people than our close relationships. And, you know, um, in the West Midlands, in, in the Domestic Abuse Commission, the statistics from last year, the last year of lockdown were just very scary. To a male, it's, it's embarrassing and scary that uh, women tried to leave abusive relationships on average seven times before they made it, if they survived to make it. Now, what sort of community do we have that doesn't recognize that and all the issues that might go into explain that? You try and leave seven times before you're successful. There's is, all sorts of things we need to think about. Is some of on. that shame and you know, the kind of the stigma, or is it also just not understanding the resources that are available? I think it's both, but I think the former is very important. I think people worry about what others will think of them. Um, and I think, uh, but, but I think generally we don't have many resources and sufficient resources available. The biggest constraints against domestic violence are how you escape and when it's, there's a housing issue, there's a finance issue in a, in a, in a world in which uh, patriarchy still is influential in terms of the economic model. Thank you. And I have a question for the whole panel. Uh, in your experiences, how do we measure the success of community-based approaches? Uh, and I know, Toby, if you have some initial thoughts to get started. Yeah, I mean, I think that, you know, in the work that I do in kind of bringing people together to see if they can come up with an agreement about um, the situation and what they would like to have happen moving forward, I think there's a tendency to just look at, at settlement or, you know, agreement as an indicator of, of success. And um, although I think that if you continually bring people together and they never reach an agreement, right, you probably should question and explore. But that really is not the primary driving indicator. And even if the uh, success is an agreement, it really should be a lasting durable agreement, right? Not just an agreement for agreement's sake. And so I think that, you know, part of the, uh, 
the measures that are often set up and metrics in these evaluations really are looking at this um, quantitative, you know, did did the, did the event occur and was was an agreement reached and really have to get kind of beyond that um, to really what is success? It is kind of change starting to change um, perspective do people start to look at the others involved in the situation um you know differently and starting to see if someone as an individual kind of rather than the other do they start to have an increased level of recognition of of their role or other sources of of contribution um to the to the um situation in the school context right it's not just have expulsions and suspensions gone down because if that's all you're looking at, chances are they've just been replaced by something else, right? Um, that may be just as bad. So really you want to be looking at do students feel and staff, right? Do they feel supported in the school? Do they feel safe in the school? Are they learning equitably um, throughout the school? And those are just so much harder to measure. They often take a longer amount of time. Um, and so it is a real challenge to kind of quantifying success, evaluating um, success. But really it is a little bit of starting to shift the perspective and what, what is reasonable to expect. There is a lot Lot that contributes to violence and vulnerability and there's very few single programs that are you know on their own going to really make a very huge shift um, and really kind of looking at how can we pull these things together right and gee I think you talked about in the cure program really maybe starting off with a focus but then really having to bring in so many other things uh, to, to make that overall program successful and meaningful for the for the youth involved. And I would say as a youth development organization, um, we are kind of prompted to produce the quantitative stuff. So retention rates and you know, did their test scores go up? And I think often it's it's really the anecdotal things that I think are, are most successful. So the scholar that has PTSD that wouldn't let you touch them, but can now stand in front of an audience and give a scientific presentation and shake hands with someone. So you know, how do you kind of you know, explain that in evaluation or, um, you know, and a lot of times funders really don't want that information. They're looking for the hard data. And so um, I think that's just something, a cultural thing with like funding organizations of, you know, allow us to tell some stories <laughs> or to, uh, you know, and if we, you know, sometimes the data doesn't support you, like, especially now in the pandemic, um, grades are horrible right now, <laughs> you know, online learning, um, you know, like, nope, we have not seen great level improvement right now because they cannot even function being online. So uh, does that mean our program's a failure right now? Of course not. Um, we've leaned in even more. So I think even in times of, of stress um, and really circumstances like what's happening right now, it's it's harder to produce those kind of standardized uh, data, data points. So, so for me, the, the, the question of success is the hard part because success means different things and success looks different, different, uh, different players. So success from a policy perspective is likely to look different to success from a law enforcement perspective and it's different to what might be for a, a community development organization right down to the individual on the street. Uh, and that, that that's that's one of the, the hard things from my background in, in with counterterrorism. Uh, I, it, it's even harder to measure because uh, if if we put in physical measures and they mitigate the impact of an attack, is that really a success? Because we fail to prevent somebody from actually carrying an attack in the first place. So, so it is it is very hard. Uh, the other big uh, issue that we have uh, in the area that I look at is proportionality. So looking at how proportional interventions are to the problem. Uh, and what we've also found is, is, well, who determines proportionality? Is it the policy? Is it the practitioners? Is it people on the ground? And the difficulty is, is that a lot of the interventions pay lip service to the co-creation but, but they're, they're not truly co-created. And, and they're, they're usually going from uh, funding to funding. 
And if, if nobody can provide the funding, then the sustainability is, is, is really inhibited. I just wanted to say, I think um, just like we see violence as, as the end outcome of a lot of different things that need to be prevented, that need to be, that happened before the, the violent event, um, we should also be able to measure the violence in that way by looking at all the things that cause violence and whether those got better or not. So maybe, you know, uh, the amount of education or the social relationships that a person has, all those things could be measures as well. And then I just wanted to say that also a lot of the times what we do is just try to measure how much we've implemented of the program just to measure the program, even though, you know, because it's really hard to decrease violence quickly. And some of the funders really, have, you know, we have a short period of time to respond to them. So looking at how many trainings you delivered or how many kids you serve or things like that can also be valuable. And then I'm just going back to what Mike was saying about the vulnerable, I think, you know, we have to think about all the populations that are vulnerable. I think women during the pandemic are, and I think children are also, just like uh, racial minorities are or people that have low income. And most of it because they don't have as much control over their own lives as people who aren't vulnerable are. And I think it's a good thing to keep in mind when we think about violence. And that's why I like the name of this program, Vulnerability and Violence, because it really captures what happens when there's violence. <laughs> So I'm often reminded in this conversation, I agree with you, Carol, entirely, that it's a, it's a very powerful combination of, of ideas for this program. But you know, in the work on human security generally, the United Nations set out a, a campaign of universal approaches to providing freedom from fear, providing freedom from want, and provide the freedom to live with respect and indignity. These are hugely important things that, um, and in any metric of how successful we are at community level, let's go back to those. Let's go back to see how communities ha enjoy that freedom. We know that some do, but we know also that many don't, whether they're young people, ethnicities, new migrants, or whether they're just old guys who've been living a long time in a rapidly changing community. Do we have freedom from fear? Do we have freedom from want? And do we have the freedom to live in a, in a community where we're respected and where we can live in dignity? These are hugely important, I think. Well, thank you all for joining us today. We're actually at our time. Time flew, didn't it? <laughs> uh, well, thanks to our panel and thank you all for joining us. A reminder that our next webinar will be on April 27th at 11 a.m. Eastern Standard Time on vulnerability, victimhood, and breaking the cycle. Thanks everyone and have a great day.